Hi, this is Vidya Nirkundar from Mentor a Siemens Business. In this video, I'm going to be talking about utilizing different two different standards, IEEE standard 1687 and IEEE standard 1500 within a single design. For this, I'm going to be starting with a brief introduction of both the standards and how 1500 can be described using 1687. First, with IEEE 1500 architecture, which talks about embedded core test, it's used for test reuse and enabling embedded core integration. It uses a wrapper serial port, but the wrapper parallel port is optional when using 1500. The wrapper serial port has a wrapper serial input and a wrapper serial output and a wrapper serial control. The wrapper um, needs to have a wrapper instruction, which is the WIR. It also requires a wrapper boundary register, and a wrapper bypass register is utilized when the core needs to be bypassed. Let's look at what IEEE 1687 architecture is. It is internal JTAG. This methodology includes hardware architecture that describes on-chip network connectivity. There are no central instructions and does not include a controller or state machine like the 1500 type WIR, WBY, or the bypass, or like the 1149.1 type IR are not necessary. The standard proposes a segment insertion bit, which is SIB, that serves as a bypass function. The SIB has shift and update. The update side holds the value that operates the SIB as a scan multiplexer, which can reconfigure the scan paths. The SIBs can be nested and used for configuring any number of instruments. We're going to be looking at the IEEE 1500 and 1687 in terms of the different um, what their comparabilities are. First, from an architecture standpoint, 1500 uses wrapper instruction register, 1687 uses segment insertion bit. The language is described using CTL, which is core test language for IEEE 1500 versus for 1687, and instrument connectivity language is used. The vector language used is style, which is the standard test interface language for 1500. For 1687, a procedural description language, or PDL, is used. Access to the chip is connected to, via a test access port, which is a tab in the IEEE 1500 versus in the 1687. It's flexible, and the tab connectivity to the tab is optional. The select signal is based on the instructions from the tab. The shift, capture, and update, plus the select WIR is generated at the tab. The shift capture and update signals are generated at the tap. The select is generated locally, closer to the instrument. For embedded tap support, 1500 does not support it natively and it does not describe how to connect it. But in 1687, it's supported natively. The scalability of 1500 is limited. It's based on centralized instructions versus 1687 is flexible and scalable for on-chip instruments and cores. There's a fixed tap size, and the routing is independent on the number of instruments that it can connect. The time to market, the architecture needs to be planned and implemented. I'm going to cover more about this in the next slide. Whereas the 1687 is portable and plug-and-play infrastructure, and it supports cores with 1500 access mechanism. Some of the drawbacks of 1500 connections, because you need to plan how the 1500 cores are connected. Either it can be daisy chained one after the other, or connected to one time scheme, or you can access a group of networks together using a star protocol. <coughs> When using IEEE 1500 standards, it can be described using ICL to IJTAG, even if the instruments connected below the 1500 
does not need to be compliant to IEEE 1687 standard. That's the reference material that you can refer to written by Martin Keim. So to summarize, the advantages of IEEE 1600 are flexible, scalable, plug-and-play infrastructure, portable ar architecture that's applicable to hierarchical designs, the tap controller is optional for chip access, embedded tap is supported, and there's support for IEEE 1500 cores. Present products use IEEE 1600 as the backbone infrastructure. Thanks for watching this video. Thanks for your time.